Right, okay, so good morning, everyone. So we're picking up on what we talked about the previous two sessions, and we're going into a bit more detail. So this should help you kind of step up a little bit, take some of the more kind of um, basic skills, which, um, you know, kind of most people can do, you know, and actually start moving into the stuff that's going to, you know, give you an edge and make your stuff just a little bit better. Okay, so as I just said, um, obviously, this is the third in the series. Um, we're going to be looking at video camera or video editing, uh, camera skills, lighting skills, and sound skills. Um, so we're kind of moving between all four things. Um, it's not necessarily a case we'll go from one straight into the other uh, neatly because we're going to jump back and forward a little bit depending on how the techniques feed into one another. So um, as always, pen and paper, great to have. And let's get started. Let's do a quick recap of the video editing stuff. Okay, so last time we introduced it, um, as you know, video editing is taking your video clips and audio files, mix them all together, creating a finished film. Um, editing obviously lets you remove the bits you don't want, um, add in music and effects, uh, improve the quality of the footage just by playing with it a little bit. And uh, the main thing to remember is not to panic. Um, you don't need to know what every button does. Um, obviously, all the different types of software that are available there's loads of different types. They're all going to be laid out differently. They're all going to have different functionalities, et cetera. Um, and you don't need to know every single button to make it work. All you need to do is know some of the basics. Um, and then over time, you can kind of build that skill set up. But even just knowing the basic skills, you're going to be able to kind of get some really, really good results. Um, also worth bearing in mind, this is obviously the software on uh, desktop computers and your laptops. It's typically way more advanced than the stuff you get on your tablets and mobile phones. Um, and as I said last time, I think editing on a mobile phone will be tricky. Um, so it's just a wee recap of that. Again, we'll just look at the um, the way out. You'll see uh, we've obviously got the clips coming on the left in the bin. This is from Premiere Pro. Uh, source window, where if you double click an icon in your bin, you'll be able to see it. Um, timeline display. So this is where the, um, obviously the, the kind of the video that you're composing goes uh, and displays. Um, you drag your clips from the source window into the timeline. You've got basic tools here, effect tools that you can just click on and apply different effects. Um, you have a video track that's on top of the sequence and an audio track that's on the bottom of the sequence. You can wear up on the video. So you can put another video on top of uh, V2, V3, or how many high Vs you want to go. And then you can do the reverse with audio. So it goes A1, A2, A3, descending. Um, and you can see there the audio track has um, left and right audio represented, left on top and right on the bottom. So again, the skills are very transferable between uh, different software. Um, okay, very, very quick recap again. As I said, the video track is there on the top and the audio is there. Your audio levels are monitored here. So when you play the clip, you'll see the vertical line just moves from left to right um, as you go. Basically, if you're, you know this from when you're playing a DVD or you know, you're doing like, stuff like um, recording TV yourself or pausing live TV, then obviously a timeline appears and obviously you have a left to right. It's very much the same thing. And then the audio displays here, just as it was before, it'll bounce up and down as we talked about last time with sound stuff. Um, and you just monitor it. If it goes too high, it'll go red and you're peaking. And uh, it's just something to keep an eye on. Um, and yeah, the thing is, it's actually not as complicated as it looks. And that's probably the most uh, important thing to take away from this. Um, at first, it just seems like an intimidating mess of windows. As time goes by, it's actually fairly straightforward. Um, you just need to know where everything's weighed out. Okay, so we're talking about transitions. Um, transitions are effects that we use between clips. Um, and obviously, the different types of transitions include a cross dissolve, uh, dip to black, dip to white, or white. Um, there's one from Star Wars on the right, which is a GIF. Um, I think that's going to become a little bit irritating because it keeps whooping. Um, but you see how, obviously, they wipe um, from one scene to the other scene. That's a really, really common effect in pretty much all the Star Wars films. If you if you watch Star Wars, you'll see that. They, they use a transition like that constantly. Um, they can use uh, they can use uh, they can they can be used for different things. So, for example, um, uh, a cross dissolve, like you know, fading uh, can imply that time has passed, or you know, dipping the white and come back up again implies that time has passed, etc. Um, some are all a bit tacky. So you get things like a star wipe, which is when um, basically a, a star shape will appear to kind of like you know uh, take you into the next scene, or a quark wipe, which is when there'll be like a three hundred sixty degree whoop. Um, which is again, it, again, it's like a passage of time. You sometimes might see that like a cooking show or something, but it's just a little bit tacky. Um, <clears throat> it's best not to use too many transitions, as using too many, um, like from one to the next shot to the next shot to the next shot, it starts to become a little bit distracting, and you can't actually focus on the footage. Um, okay, so here's a demo of some common transitions, and you can think about the different ways this uh, impacts your interpretation of the footage. So here we go. 
First of all, no transition. This is just standard one shot, two shot. Cross dissolve. <clears throat> okay, so we faded from one to the other. Dip to black. Dip to white. Wipe. And barn doors. So to see how all of them have very different effects and impacts, you can obviously choose the ones that you want to use on your transitions that will have different effects. Probably the most common one will be if you cross dissolve from one to the other, it can apply the passage of time. Um, you will also maybe want to uh, fade up from black. So you start on black and you fade up. A lot of films start and end that way. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, you know, it's just about finding the way that you, know, you want the footage to move from one bit to the other bit. Okay, so um, cropping and zooming in. Uh, again, this is very basic, but I'm just recapping this because I didn't get much of a chance to go into it last week. Um, obviously, you can crop and zoom in. You'll probably know this yourself from mucking about with photographs, etc. The thing to remember though is that when you're doing this with video, that's a set resolution. Um, when you uh, start to zoom in, what it's doing is it's digitally increasing the size of the pixels. So you're gonna lose image quality. So the more that you do it, the more quality you're gonna lose. So there's kind of a threshold after which you shouldn't really do it anymore because it will start to come really pixelated and blocky. It's a form of digital zoom, which um, if we're talking about this from camera skills, um, you can use optical zoom and that's like a real zoom. Your lens is actually zooming in. Um, digital zoom is just taking the image and it's just enlarging it. And when you do that, you start to lose quality. Um, scale of an image is normally um, listed as being 100%. Um, so when you zoom in, you increase it above 100%. So say you jump to 110 or 120%. Um, it's normally called scale. Um, the reverse is possible. If you go um, below 100%, um, you obviously, you're kind of like going to say 90% or 80% and then it'll start to shrink. Um, but the problem with that is um, if you do it, there isn't going to be enough um, video to fill the frame. So that's fine if your video is bigger than the size of the frame or if you've got a frame you're going to stick on it, like a border, um, which you could obviously just stick on the video. Um, but you have to bear in mind that if you start shrinking it beyond a certain point, then obviously you're just going to have like black bars um, because it won't fill the whole space. It can be useful for hiding um, things that you want to get rid of in the shot, um, but obviously it's best to try and get it right first time. I'll show you a couple of examples here. So this is trying to hide the pole on the left. Okay, so we've hidden the pole on the left. Um, that was just a very, very quick one last night. The, actually, the footage there is actually angled to the to the right. One thing that we could have done, um, which um, uh, would be useful, is because we zoomed in, we now have the option to rotate it a little bit. So I could rotate that maybe about um, maybe a couple of degrees to the left, and that would just sort of bring it in. Um, and because it's zoomed in, we've got more flexibility to zoom it in without um, introducing any sort of um, uh, issues at the borders. Whereas if we took a standard image and rotated it, you know what would happen, obviously part of it would be sticking off the edge and obviously there'd be sort of like black lines on the top and the bottom. Um, but because we're zoomed in, we can get past that um, and just make it easier. So in this one, this is an old video of mine and something I was looking at that really frustrated me about it was the, the door that's coming through on the right. So I just took this clip and just zoomed in a little bit and look at the difference it makes. A lot less distracting just because we've managed to zoom in slightly and fill more of that frame. So again, just you can see the difference right away. There's a thing on the right here. It's just a little bit distracting. It just catches your eye. It's just, you know, it's in the way. Zooming in, we've got rid of it. Very, very simple way to get rid of that. Okay, um, so audio and video sync. It's quite important. When you're recording your video and your audio, um, if you do this on separate devices, you're going to have to sync it up. And that just means bring it together so it plays at the same time. Um, one of the easiest ways to do this is just to clap. Um, and then when you um, play the footage back, you'll see the clap and you will see on the audio timeline it will spike. Um, and obviously you then match those bits up. You can see here, um, there's sort of like um, unsynced audio and synced audio. You can see it just doesn't align very well. So you can obviously kind of match the shape of the audio in terms of the waveform. Um, you can match it there. So you would do this if, for example, this blue is the audio that's come straight off the camera, the camera's microphone, and the green is the audio that has come in from an external recorder. And obviously we're going to match those up. You would just click it, drag it, all the rest of it, and align it to make it so it's exact. The only thing you want to do is make sure it's pretty much um, aligned perfectly because it's off by what we do it, then obviously lip sync's going to be off. People are going to be, the mouse are going to be moving at a different rate to the, um, the, the actual speech that you can hear. So um, that could be a bit distracting. Um, it can be a little tricky um, to get it right, um, especially if you don't have an exact clap. 
And uh, most professional productions will use a clapper board. So if you ever wondered why people in movies have those boards that go uh, lights, camera, action, whatever, what's, you know, clap, snap, and then they have the snap on it. Um, that's why it's so that they have a visual cue and they have a loud noise so that they can sync it all up. So you can actually buy them, they're quite cheap. You can get like one on Amazon for like a tenner or something like that. Um, so, you know, it's useful to have, but simple solution is just to clap. Um, okay, here's a demonstration from uh, an old interview where I've basically got one where it's synced and one where it's not synced. So take a look. It's a lovely high street. Um, it's a great walk. It's a lovely atmosphere. It's a lovely high street. Um, it's a great walk. It's a lovely atmosphere. And you see how the second one there, it just doesn't work right because the audio is playing at a different rate to the, to the voice. And it's very distracting because you're looking at it and you're thinking, why isn't his mouth moving at the same rate as his speech? So, yeah. Okay, doc. So um, it's probably one of the final things on video editing before we move on to more kind of advanced stuff. Um, once you finish the video editing, um, you're going to have to export the video as a full video. So um, what this means is um, your project file is just loads of raw clips. And then what you need to do is um, turn those raw clips into a video file in its own right. So if you send someone the project file, they can't watch the video because the project file is referencing other video files and it can't see um, you know, the person on the other end doesn't have access to those. So the, the project file is just going to be effectively empty and just say clips missing, clips missing, clips missing. Um, so you need to export it so it's its own video file on its own right. So you do that, there's different options. You just mostly go file, export, etc. depending on the software. Um, it can be a little bit time consuming. So you've got to think about that, um, factoring the time. Um, exporting um, a few minutes of video can sometimes take, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes, depending on the amount of complexity in the edit. So if you've got a really, really complex edit with loads of effects, then it's going to take much longer because the video's got to take time to process that. Um, so it's also worth keeping backups of your raw files as well, um, because you never know if you're going to need to make edits at a later date. Um, you can only keep, if you only keep the final video and then somebody says, oh, can we change that or we can take this out? You're not going to be able to go back and make any edits. So you want to keep your raw files. And that's actually also really useful because um, you can actually start to build an archive. So say you're working on a later project, and then you're like, oh, you know what? There's a shot in that earlier project that did be perfect for this. You can take that and you can stick that in because you've got the archive. It's like, oh, it's on that hard drive. So that's why it's really important to um, think about storage. Um, the only thing I'd probably add to this that I haven't listed here is that um, hard drives can be a little bit expensive. Um, I have a lot of hard drives. I think I've got over, I think I've got about 15 external hard drives now. And also hard drives can fail over time. So if there's anything you really, really need, um, essential, essential, then you want to make sure that you have that uh, like backups of the backups. Um, so it can get quite expensive just keeping at it. Okay, so now we're getting into the more kind of advanced stuff that's worthwhile. But you'll say it's advanced, but a lot of this stuff is kind of the stuff that um, is on a relatively basic level, but it, it, it's, it's, it's stuff that people would miss. Um, so for example, setting the white balance. So we spoke about this before in the camera skills uh, workshop when we spoke about how um, obviously white has different temperatures. So, um, you know, outside white can be quite blue and inside white can be quite red, depending on sort of like the, the, the lamps that you're using. Um, and obviously you want to try and make sure that the camera interprets white in the right way. So our eyes can just adjust naturally to see white in different, um, uh, different contexts, but cameras don't do that. and need to be manually adjusted. So sometimes if you record a clip and you look at it and it's bright blue and you think, why is it bright blue? Or sometimes you record a clip and you think, why is it bright red? That's why, it's because the camera's automatic settings or the settings that you've left it on are interpreting the white in the wrong way. So what you have to do is set the white balance. And to do this, most cameras have a, uh, a, a function here. This is one from the camera that I use, the GH5, where there's different options. There's an auto white balance, one for sunny white, one for being in cloud, one for uh, being in the shade, one for being in tungsten white. And then there's all sorts of different adjustments that go beyond that you can scroll between. Um, one of the uh, sort of traditional ways to do it is to get someone to hold up a white piece of paper. And to be honest, white pieces of paper aren't necessarily the best because um, they can have individual variances within them. But you get someone to hold up a white bit of paper and then you zoom in on that and then you adjust the settings so that that paper shows as being white. And if that piece of paper shows up as being white as opposed to um, a sort of a shade of the color, then you've got it right. Um, and that's how you would know. Um, a lot of cameras would have a setting where you would zoom in on that you would then press the button, it would identify the color of the paper, adjust that to being white, 
you would come back out and in theory the colors of the room would be would be right um that actually helps a lot when you're then going to things like for example color correction which will come into shortly um because um if you get your colors right or at least as close to being right as possible when you're recording um it makes life so much simpler at later day and um, the presets as i say are kind of a quick fix and uh, it's, it's worth just being aware of where those are on your cameras most mobile phone cameras won't have these settings as default um, but if you get the third party apps, third party camera apps, etc., then you'll go to access that. Uh, this falls on quite easily into color correction. Um, so color corrections when you um, are adjusting the colors um, of the video after the fact. So um, you'll be familiar with this if you use any Instagram photos. Um, obviously you can adjust things like the temperature or the warmth, um, obviously exposure, contrast, highlight, shadows, um, all the rest of it, saturation, you know, how much um, intense it is in the color or how faded it is. Um, there's loads of different settings. You can also play around with color wheels to add more color in, take more color out, etc. cetera. Um, but if you, if, if you get the white balance wrong, you're probably definitely going to have to do this. If your footage is bright blue, you're going to have to go into it, reduce the blue and up the red just so that the, the, um, the, the, the colors actually start to look like they're meant to. Um, so obviously you can use them for different effects. So if you want your scene to look really, really warm and really hot, then obviously you're gonna increase the, the reds and the oranges. If you want your scene to look like a cold winter's day and it's really, really freezing and everyone's really, really chilly, you want to increase the blues because it looks like you know a cold winter's day and there's a lot of kind of blue white. Um, you can play around with the different levels of colors. I've got red, green, blue, but there's obviously all these different settings. And um, a common one there, the reason I've got Breaking Bad, a little quick there, is quite a funny joke that emerges as a meme you can see. It's called the Mexico filter. So uh, you may be familiar with this, but every time somebody wants to um, show Mexico in TV and film, what they normally do is they just up the, the oranges massively um, to sort of imply, oh, we're in Mexico now, we're in a really warm place, a really warm country. Um, that happens really, really often. If you watch a lot of American TV shows, you'll see that the, the stuff in um, the scenes in the United States are often sort of set in sort of like um, regular kind of colors in terms of white balance being set right. And then obviously, as soon as they cross the border to Mexico, all of a sudden it's orange and they just up everything. It's very, very common, so keep an eye for that. Um, don't overdo it unless it's intentional. And bear in mind that the settings and controls are gonna be different in all your different software. Again, most basic camera apps won't include this. Most camera um, editing apps won't include this um, on your mobile phone or your tablet. So you might need to download third party software to play around with this. Okay, here's an example of color correction. I did a before and after on this clip. So see what you think. This is before, very flat, not much saturation. And that's after. And again, it's not a huge thing, but you see the difference. So let's just play that back again, okay? So the first one, very faded. Suddenly just a bit more color, a bit more life. Just, you know, faded, a bit more color, a bit more life. The, the colors pop more, you know? So those are obviously just very, very simple examples, but you can see the difference. Okay, now we're getting into the, the funky stuff. Okay, so your camera. The way that your camera interprets white, um, it uses uh, three different ways of doing this. Um, it will use, uh, basically it's more your lens than, than the camera, but the lens has an aperture. An aperture is how much white the lens can let into it. The ISO is the camera sensor and how much sensitivity the camera sensor is to white. And the shutter speed is how many times the, the shutter refreshes. So you see it's like a chopping motion. It's like the, the, the shutter is just constantly going up and down. So. If you have a slow shutter speed, more white's getting in. And obviously that means the image is going to be brighter. But if you have a fast shutter speed, that basically means that obviously it's going like that. There's not enough of, um, opportunity for the white to get through. Um, ISO means that um, the camera sensor is more and more sensitive to, 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 to white. But when it does that, it starts to introduce the sort of artificial grainy stuff. And I'll show you examples of these. And the aperture is just um, represented by the F stops. So a really, really high aperture camera at lens would be like um, f1.7 and then you start to lose it a bit and go to like 4.5 and go below that. Um, if you're in really, really bright environments, you might dip your lens down to like f11 or something like that. So the lower the number, the more white's getting in, the, the higher the number, the less white's getting in. It's very counterintuitive, but that's, that's how it is. Um, so the camera can be adjusted for white using those different settings. Um, how much white is getting in the lens, how sensitive the sensor is, and how fast the shutter is going. Now that has different effects. So you can see here, that's a shot from Apollo 13 with um, a high, a high, say a high aperture, but it's like really like, it'd be like one point, whatever. Um, so it's like a low number. And you can see that it's wet in a lot of white, but the result of that is that the background is very, very, very shallow. 
then that could be a stylish choice that you want because you maybe you want it to be really, really sharp and everything else is in focus. Um, the alternative is you've got um, a low aperture, then everything, including the background, might be in focus. So um, this will be familiar with anyone who's done photography before. Um, you're, um, if you've got a shallow depth of field, basically you've got just a shallow bit that's in focus and everything in the background is out of focus. And that would just obviously depend on you adjusting the focus ring right um, on, your, on your camera lens. Now we can obviously demonstrate uh, that here, but I'll also demonstrate ISO and shutter speed as well to show the difference. The thing about shutter speed is that if you have too slow shutter speed, where basically the, um, the, the camera shutters only like refreshing that often, then what will happen is that the image starts to become blurry because the movement of the light starts to become sort of like, you know, um, like a smear of light. Um, you can use that again for deliberate effects, but a fast shutter means that everything will start to look really, really jerky. And you can see that in, for example, sports. Um, so if you watch television, uh, uh, if, you watch television if you watch like sports on TV, then um, you'll see that it can be very, very, very jerky. Um, and the reason for that is because the shutter is moving so quickly to keep up with the speed of the sport. So let's show a couple of examples of that. So let's look at ISO. Here's a clip from a film premiere I was at uh, last year for Cold. Um, and you can see here, there's some green artificial noise, um, which is uh, in, the, in the background. Can you see that? It's because it's a very dark room, artifacts have been introduced because we've artificially uh, increased the, the sensitivity of the, of the camera sensor and how it interprets light. And that's introduced the green. So that's obviously very different to obviously this effect where um, you obviously have a shallow depth of field because you've got a high uh, amount of light coming into the lens. This is the actual sensor itself has been adjusted. And then here's an example of um, fast shutter speed. So this is a clip that I took recently for the Glenopolis Motorsport Club I was filming some of their cars. And you can see immediately um, how it refreshes really, really, really quickly um, when you're looking for it because it's trying to keep up with the speed of the car. So it's slightly jerky. And the reason for that, partially is because um, this uh, uh, PowerPoint is playing the quick place mode, um, but it's also to do with the fact that the actual um, camera is refreshing really, really quickly to get a really sharp image and to keep up with what's going on. So you can see, obviously, the um, it's just a really, really quick refresh. If you watch football, this is really, really common to see in football. So the way in which your camera interprets light can be adjusted in different ways, and you can use those for different effects, such as full focus. This is when you're mucking about with the aperture um, on the um, uh, on, on the um, on the focus ring. So if you've got a, um, a good aperture and obviously you've got a nice shallow depth of field, you can move the focus between two different points. So you manually adjust the focus ring in real time on your camera to just, you know, go from one point to the other point, just turn it and then turn it back. You get some really dramatic effects like this one on the, on the, on the right, which is from Goodfellas. Um, after a certain point, you won't be able to do this though. So if, you're, if your um, aperture gets beyond like say like 3.5-ish, I would say, um, then the image is gonna start getting really flat. Um, and because everything is in focus and because of that, because of everything being in focus, you can't do that technique. So you need like a, a really low aperture to be able to pull this off. Um, you need manual control of the lens to go from point A to point B, unless your camera lets you program in settings that go from start here and then go here. That's uncommon unless you pay for really expensive um, camera equipment. Um, usually better with prime lens as well. If remember I talked before about prime lens when it's fixed at a focal length rather than a zoom lens where you can zoom in. Um, prime lenses generally get better results for this. And the sharper, the, um, the, the, the aperture, so say you're at like f1.7, you're going to get a more dramatic effect on this than you are, say, if you're at like 3.5 or 4, um, because um, obviously it's flatter. It, the more, uh, the less white is getting in the camera, the flatter the image is. But the other thing I may remind is the fact that it will be hard to stay in focus. So if you're at a really, really um, shallow depth of field there, it's going to take a few attempts to get it right because obviously you have to go from point A to point B. And if you make it, if you get it wrong, then somebody behind, you've gone from one point in focus to something else that's out of focus. So that can take a little bit of time to get that right. But um, some professional teams will use a focus puller who's dedicated to just go from that to that. Um, yeah, it's fun. Frames per second. Um, this is relevant as well. So cameras record video at a rate of frames per second. And I don't really have a way of demonstrating this on here because um, I don't like the quick play in PowerPoint. Um, just you know, effectively enough. Um, but um, a frame is like one still image, um, which when played with our ones in sequence creative videos. So in the UK, we normally do 25 frames per second. So we play 25 images in quick succession 
um, and that kind of creates the illusion of uh, motion. Um, and we normally do 25 FPS or 50 FPS. In the USA, you might get like 24 FPS and 48 FPS. A lot of video games is normally do 30 FPS or 60 FPS. Um, 25 is around about the, the amount that our eyes need um, to create the impression of moving image. If you record it less than that, then the footage is gonna to start to appear a bit jerky and awkward. Um, and so this, this is relevant to us because um, it can create different effects. So a 25 FPS, um, video looks very cinematic because that's the rate at which most films have traditionally always been played. If you play at like 50 FPS, which is like when you watch BBC News or um, a news program, um, then obviously the footage is kind of smoother, so to speak, and that's because there's more frames per second. But it looks less cinematic, it looks less dramatic. It's hard to explain this unless I've got examples directly in front of me, which I don't, but um, The Hobbit, if you ever saw The Hobbit in cinema, you would remember that it would really smooth. And a lot of people said it just looked a bit weird. And the reason for that wasn't just because it was 3D, it's because it was played at this high frame rate where they played it at like, I think it was like 48 frames per second. And it just looked like you were watching a news program but with Hobbits in it and it looked totally bizarre. Um, so, so the way this is relevant in terms of um, shutter speed is um, the amount of frames per second, you want to uh, double your shutter speed to that. So if you're recording 25 frames per second, you want to generally be at a shutter speed of about 50 unless you're going to start obviously doing things that are like, you know, get a fast char for like, you know, fast technique with the kind of thing I was talking about before with the sports stuff. So if you're recording at 25 frames per second, you probably want a shutter of 50. If you're recording at 50 frames per second, you probably want a shutter of about 100. Um, it's not a hard and fast rule. You don't need to stick to it, but generally it's quite a good thing to, to understand. Okay. Um, and obviously the more frames you have per second, the smoother the video is going to appear. Um, if you play video games, this will be familiar to you. Um, if you want, the best thing to do here, watch um, a news program, then immediately switch over to a movie and watch the difference in just how it, how it looks, how it feels in terms of the movement. And you'll be able to see that there's less frames playing in the movie and it looks more cinematic as a result of that. Um, slow motion. So by recording loads of frames per second, um, normally with a fast shutter speed, uh, you can get the option of using slow motion. So for example, if you record at 50 frames per second, um, basically the camera within one uh, second is recording 50 frames. And if you play that at 25 frames per second, then that one second clip suddenly becomes two seconds because obviously it's taking longer to get through it. And if you play that at say a, um, with a fast shutter speed where it's you know um, sharp enough to capture all the images, um, you can get a nice slow motion effect. So um, basically to do this, it may be easier to show than to tell. So here we go. So we start with the footage sped up for a more dramatic impact. It's recorded at 180 frames per second on a really, really fast char. Um, and then, so we speed up, then we slow down just by playing the frames at a really, really low rate, and then we speed up again. So take a look at this. Okay. you've obviously recorded more and more and more and more uh, frames per second, which gives you the options to slow it right down without losing any movement. If you attempt to do slow motion with less than the amount of um, frames that you would need, so for example, uh, 25 frames per second, um, and you attempt to um, you know, play it in slow motion, um, you're basically doing 12.5 frames per second, so the footage is going to look really jerky, and the movements are going to be a bit kind of like robotic and weird, whereas if it's recorded, say you're recording at 50 frames per second, and then you drop that, 25, 50% uh, to uh, 25 frames per second, then the movement's gonna be smooth because you've got enough movement there for regular motion. Most modern DSLRs, mobile phones actually have these options built in. Um, uh, you can record, for example, up to 180 FPS. Um, you get some amazing effects with this. Um, one thing to remember is it doesn't often record sound when you do this, um, but you also have to match the shutter speed accordingly. And again, it's not, a, it's not a hard and fast rule, but you probably want to. And also bear in mind that when you're recording more frames per second, less light's getting into the camera. So you probably have to adjust your settings accordingly because um, obviously it's moving so quickly that you're going to have to compensate for that. Um, and it's usually easier to speed up footage um, for fast motion as that just removes frames. Um, so here we go, a time lapse is another effect. Um, time lapse works by taking a number of still images and then playing them as video sequence. So here's one that I did at Calton Hill and we went up to Calton Hill at eight in the morning in winter, uh, this was January, um, and pump the tripod down, set the camera so that it took one photograph every five seconds or so, record it over 20 minutes, and then we get a sunrise effect. So the camera's taking pictures at regular intervals, and then you just play those photographs 
in sequence. It requires a lot of photographs and a lot of time. And it could be really cool if you're doing this in a winter morning. Um, common ones are things like sunrises or seeing traffic speed by. Um, you get some really interesting effects. Because, but you need to set your shutter to be kind of um, slow enough to actually kind of get those kind of trail white effect. This is what I'm talking about by the, the slow shutter creating a kind of blur, but it can be used really effectively. So you can see the traffic on the right is kind of blurring as it moves. And that's because obviously the shutter is slow, so they get a trail of light before the shutter refreshes. So um, obviously you have to kind of compensate again for your white settings. Probably a lot of trial and error involved in this. Um, and the reason for that is because if you get it wrong in the settings, you might let too much white in, or you might let not enough white in. Um, it's really difficult to get it right. Um, so if the first time you do this, you get it completely wrong, don't beat yourself up. And if you're going to do sunrise, um, you can get little um, apps uh, that you can download, which will tell you the um, direction to point your camera by pulling up your phone in the sky and it'll sort of like track the motion of the sun and what the sunrise is coming up from over here. And you're like, okay, great. You put your camera there, get the sunrise, etc. But again, as I say, trial and error, you're going to have to um, think about how you're going to do it. It's really easy to overexpose your shots, get too much white in, and then it just shows like an image of pure white. So it takes a bit of practice. Okay, uh, room tone, coming at the sound stuff. Um, so when you record an audio, it's really useful to record room tone. Um, that means basically um, the sound of the environment, which you spoke about before last time. So um, you want everyone to be quiet for a second, just while you record nothing but the sound of the room. Um, everyone uh, you know, can, as we said last time, hear things um, that we filter out, but the camera won't. Um, no, everyone doesn't hear things because we, we filter them out, but the camera hears everything. Um, so what you want to do is make sure that you have that noise. And it's useful for editing because if you have to create a gap in speech and insert a cutaway, or if you want to create a little sequence um, in an environment, um, you know, but you don't have people talking during that, so suddenly you've got people talking, sound of the room, then just shot, 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 and then another bit. Um, suddenly it would just be totally dead quiet because there's no sound of the room to go with it. So you want to record the sound of the room so you can match that up. Um, it's easily overlooked, a lot of people forget to do this, but it might save you a lot of headaches, um, particularly if there's like a really irritating background noise in between somebody's speech and you're like, oh, I wish that noise wasn't there. So, uh, um, say, for example, um, you know, someone's talking, they pause to take a breath, and then someone um, drops a chair or something in the background, and then um, they then carry on with the speech. You could then just use that um, clip. You just delete the part where the, where this where the annoying sound of the of the chair drops between when the person's speaking stick in the room tone and it's smooth and consistent um a lot of people forget to do this um, and if you forget to do it you might have to spend ages going through your sound clips just looking for a bit where someone doesn't say anything that can take ages um, and you might not have it um you can see here visually demonstrated um room tone on the bottom um <clears throat> which is just sort of like very kind of like background um noise here and then when someone's speaking, obviously it's at a much higher level. Um, so you can see the difference right there. Okay, three-point light setup. Now this is really important um, if you want your shots to start working professional. So when you're filming somebody, like a subject for an interview um, in particular, the best way to light them is a three-point light setup. And you do this with three lights. So your first light is your key light. And that's the one, so if we're looking at this for example in this room, if you can see my camera, um, the, uh, the light from the window has hit me here. That would be my key light. Okay, that's why most of the light has hit me here. Now, a fill light is coming, say it was coming from this side. I don't actually, have, actually I do have a fill light. I've got a wee lamp on. So a fill light um, basically hits you from here um, on the other side, and it takes off most of the harsh shadows. Um, so basically, if, if I can show you maybe, I'll just make that much of a difference. But if I do that, basically, it, it takes off some of the harsh shadows that are being put on my face. So say this light was creating a really harsh shadow off my nose, or over my eye, then this white would come inside. It's not as strong, but it balances it out and takes off some of the harsh um, shadows. Now you would use another one from behind and that creates a separation from the background because I don't have a back white, but if I did, um, it would mean that my outline would stand out more from the environment behind me because it'd be more of a white source. So this allows somebody to stand out um, much more effectively um, from their environment and basically just it's a much more professional way of lighting someone. You would use your three lights, key light from the front, um, fill light just maybe coming from the side. Well, I say from the front, but you want to angle it so you get a nice sort of shape on the face. And then the back lights, the person stands out from the um, environment. You can use panel lights or freestanding lamps, um, but again, good lights can be expensive. Um, so yeah, that's an example of, uh, of a shot from Buffy, which uses a good three point light setup. You can see how um, obviously uh, the, the light here is multiple sources. Um, and the really good thing here is that it eliminates her hair on one side. 
which um, helps to just stand out from the background, exactly what I'm talking about. The back white that's on her, um, uh, on her hair, um, helps to separate around her, um, around her head, so it stands out much better from the background. So again, this this is a really effective way to, um, you know, light your 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 subject. And also, a lot of the harsh shadows that would be on her face have been removed because there's obviously a fill light coming in from one side. So not enough to get rid of the whole kind of dramatic white effect. But enough to kind of take off the harsh shadows over the eye that would be cast from this this white source. So bear in mind, three point white setup. You need three whites, obviously. And if you've got two people sitting in front of you, you're going to need six whites, etc. Um, obviously, you can get different colors. You can get gels, diffusers. Um, gels are just like basically um, bits of plastic or sheet that you would stick onto the you would clip on to the barn doors of a light, um, or there might be a bit to kind of swap them into, or just stick them on the front with electrical tape, just to make sure it doesn't overheat. Um, and it changes the color of the light, and obviously that can give you some really cool dramatic effects. Um, it's the same as what you would use in theater. Um, diffusers, if your light's just too harsh, you can get a bit of cloth and a diffuser um, and stick that to the front of uh, the light, and that'll just take off the intensity, bring it down a little bit. So the light's still coming through the sheet, but it's just dimmed a little bit, it's diffused. Um, which is which is useful as well for you know removing the intensity of maybe like a harsh spotlight or something like that. Um, and then obviously you can get reflectors. So this is a very easy light solution. If you are out and about and you're filming in the public space and you can't just obviously set up a big three point light setup in the middle of um, you know the the street if you're filming somebody's interview in the street, you can get someone to hold a reflector dish and just bounce the light. You see obviously there's different um, uh, covers that you can get which obviously will, will be for different sort of lighting environments. Um, you bounce the light back onto someone to kind of like, if say, say the sun's hitting them really harsh from one side, you would use the reflector to bounce light onto the other side. So it kind of balances out the face a little bit. Um, but reflectors usually require uh, another person or a stand to hold them. Um, and be careful you don't bounce light straight into the eyes. But again, this will just improve your lighting game and make things a lot better. Um, you know, um, obviously this stuff can get hot, if you are using gels or diffuser, they're attached to the front of the, 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 the light, the light itself is gonna get hot. So you might have to use gloves when you're touching them. And if you touch a gel or a diffuser, one, make sure it's fire resistant because you don't want to set fire a piece of cloth. Um, and two, um, make sure if you're using sort of heat resistant gloves, if you're taking some of that stuff off because it might be really hot and you might burn your fingers. Video structure. So again, we're coming into sort of like the editing side of things. Um, you wanna tell a story with your videos. Um, you want to have a three-act structure, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, and it's important to think about the hook of the information that you're getting people interested into. Now, a lot of this is basic storytelling. And again, it's, it's straightforward to you if you've, if you've worked in maybe like doing narrative drama or um, you've had to do presentations or speeches or essays. Um, but obviously, um, the hook is what gets people interested. Um, consider not giving it all away too quickly if people always interest. Um, you maybe want to structure it so you start with a really interesting establishing shot. So for example, say I was doing a video on um, the history of Edinburgh Castle. Probably the first shot I would want to see would be Edinburgh Castle, as opposed to somewhere within Edinburgh Castle, because I want to establish that's where we are. And additionally, we want to make sure that at the end, we've got a good final shot to end on. So we'd probably want a really nice final shot, maybe a sunset or whatever, to leave a strong impression. You also have to make sure you keep up the momentum. A lot of people focus really um, on the start of the video and the end of the video, and the middle stuff can be a bit mm, over the place. You want to try and make sure it's consistently good quality throughout. Um, cutaways and editing. This is really important. And again, for some of you guys, this might seem really basic, but it's really important to make sure that you get enough cutaways when you're shooting. So um, when I was filming in a flower shop recently, here's just some random cutaways that I grabbed, um, which were just, you know, obviously shots within the store itself to make sure I had enough. Um, basically, these are useful when you're editing because you can disguise your edits using the cutaways. So if someone's talking and you have to take some of their speech out, use the cutaway over the top of it. So for example, the second sentence there, I was like, mm, I didn't need that. I could delete that, stick a cutaway over the gap and no one would notice. In addition, it's also just quite nice to show off the space and show off the environment. Um, so cutaways are really quite good. You want to show a variety. Um, if you're watching a news interview, you'll notice something called a noddy. And a noddy is when someone just nods in an interview. So the person's talking, talking, talking. The person who's been interviewed is talking. And on the other side, the person's just going, hmm. If you watch a news interview, look for that. They will have recorded some shots of the interviewer literally just nodding their head. And they can cut that in at any point. So the person's talking, you see someone nod, cut back to the person talking again. That's to disguise the fact that they've removed some of the speech. 
to make it more succinct or to get to the point and make it more concise. Um, yeah, it's a, a really effective way of um, you know doing an interview and disguising the fact that you've actually taken some words out. Um, so when you're watching stuff, keep an eye out for if you can see the cutaways, see the noddies, um, particularly in news content. Um, make sure you capture a lot of cutaways, but it's easy to record too much. I spoke at this previously with overshooting. It's very easy to record too much. So I'm going to show you an example. Um, so here's a video that I did um, in the summer um, for the new Wine Tune Cycle Project for Green Her Body. Um, and you'll see that um, I managed to take different parts of the speech and remove them to make the sense. This guy spoke, he was a really nice guy, but he spoke maybe sort of like a paragraph of speech and I only needed like a couple of sentences. So I trimmed it down just to the sort of the key sentences. Um, and uh, you can see how I've managed to cover up those gaps by using cutaways. Following on from the boom and cycling over lockdown, we're hoping that the, the boom is going to keep going and we'll be there on the high street to help people look after their bikes. Come and speak to us and we'll get you going. So that's actually from a couple of different points from the paragraph, but because I've edited it, I've been able to kind of wait, okay, I, he said that, and then he said a sentence I don't need, so I delete that. Then he said that, I take a sentence I don't need, and delete that, and then you punch it together. The only thing to bear in mind is that ethically, you don't want to distort what someone says. So for example, all of this stuff is the stuff that he said himself, and it's all consistent with what he's saying. Um, but if I was to go in and change the order of words around um, in a way that distorted the meaning and started to create new sentences, that could be very ethically dubious if you're doing an interview. So make sure that if you're doing this, um, you want to make sure that you're <laughs> if you're doing an interview, make sure you don't distort or intentionally um, misrepresent someone. Make sure it's always their own words and make sure that you're doing it in a way which actually conveys what they're saying. Um, so I'd say remove content, but don't change content. This is an ethical thing. Okay, um, sound editing, uh, balancing sound levels. Um, so we're coming towards kind of putting all together again. When you're mixing sound levels together, you need to make sure that you can hear everything. So if your music's too loud, you're not gonna hear people talking. Um, the video is quiet so, and the person that turns up their speaker, cause like that video was really, really quiet, you know, when someone's speaking and all of a sudden they get blasted by really heavy music. The person's like, ah, and if they've got headphones on or earphones on, that can be quite dangerous. Um, um, obviously you might have experienced it yourself, you're watching a video that's really quiet and you, you turn it up and all of a sudden the music hits and it's just, whoa, blasted back. It's not ideal and as I say, it could be quite dangerous if someone's listening to it really, really closely. Um, so um, a good idea to have your music lower at the level of people speaking, so, um, but still audible. So you want to adjust your sound level so it's kind of consistent. Um, you can fluctuate music up and down as you need to. Um, different software will let you do this in different ways. Um, as always, keep an eye on the peaking, make sure you don't hit the reds because that's when your audio is too high and it's starting to distort. So say music's playing and then you drop the level down because you've introduced speech. Um, I know we have music around about minus 25 decibels to minus 30 decibels. Um, an example of this is just here. Um, and um, also it's good to cut to the rhythm and timing of the music as well. So take a look at this. It's a lovely high street, it's a great walk, it's a lovely atmosphere. Music drops, just the volume of it drops so we can hear the voice. So obviously, loud, well not loud, but audible. It's a lovely high street, it's a great walk, it's a lovely atmosphere. You can still hear it, but it's not overpowering on the person's speech. So again, you can adjust that in various settings depending on your own editing software. Um, Premiere's got a way of doing it, I'm sure other um, software have ways of doing it as well. Um, just make sure you try and balance out your sound levels. Um, also good to cut to the rhythm and tempo of the music. It's not 100% essential. Um, music's possibly going to be too long or too short for all your video to match exactly. So consider doing things like fading out in the music um, at the end so it doesn't just suddenly stop. Um, you can get tracks that are designed to whoop, which you play and then you play and you play and that will cover the gap. You can artificially lengthen the songs by going into them, chopping them up and trying to match the beats. So you can sort of like, okay, we need a bit more of that and sort of match the beats and get quite tricky. So it's best to get a track that's long enough to cover all your video or get a track that's designed to be whooped so you can just keep copy and pasting and using it. Um, okay, an example of cutting on the beat. Here's one that I was quite chuffed with for Revolution Barbershop. So you can see how that's cut to the beat of the music and it makes it more effective in terms of getting the the the, the kind of the the, the, the images um, in terms of having an impact. So you want, to, if you can, try and cut to that kind of tempo, that kind of beat, that kind of rhythm, so that it matches the music. 
Okay, um, additional tips, we're almost at the end. Um, so before starting to film, discuss where people are gonna be. It's called blocking. Just make sure people know where they're walking to. Plan beforehand is really helpful. If you've got uh, stands for microphones and lights, get some sandbags, it'll help to weigh them down so they don't blow over in the wind. Um, if you're trying to learn how to do really good shots, um, look at recreating um, the ones that you really like from films and TV. Look at the ones then and think, how did they do that? How did they create that effect? And then copy it. Um, that will teach you skills as you try to emulate what they've done. Um, always easier to film with someone else. Um, shoulder and back injury can be very common, so um, be careful for your, your posture because you're carrying heavy equipment or cameras. Um, don't injure yourself and also don't focus so much on the technical stuff that you recite the creativity. So you just have fun. And okay, that's that's the, all the kind of stuff we're talking about today. So thanks for listening. Um, remember, practice makes perfect. Um, the best way to learn will always be to get experience and to practice. Enjoy it and have fun. And you can also email me to discuss anything you want to discuss. And that is our presentation.